Very excited. I don't really know how to work one of these, so bear with me. Oh, there it works. We are so happy to be here, honestly. It's a huge thrill for Tessa and I, so thank you for inviting us. When kids are young, they believe they can grow up and be anything. Astronauts, doctors, professional athletes, fashion designers. It's true. Their imagination knows no bounds, nor does their self-belief. So what happens? When is it we're told that we can't pursue our dreams, no matter how crazy they may be? When is it we decide to play it safe? Why is it so many people limit themselves? Scott and I thought we'd share our story with you today of the last 17 years we've spent skating together. Although we can't tell you anything you don't already know. There are no shortcuts. There's no secret recipe to success. But perhaps, just maybe, you might walk away with some tidbit of information that surprises you or challenges you or hopefully inspires you. After all, you're limitless and the possibilities are endless. So when Tessa and I were six and eight, we met for the first time. And just a short year later, we began to skate together at seven and nine. Now, let's get this out of the way right away. Yes, we were boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> at six and, or seven, or you know, it was six and eight. Oh dear. Oh, <laughs> yep. But no, it's true that we didn't say a single word to each other during that time. So. That had to end pretty quickly afterwards. But what did remain was the solid and respectful partnership that we had. Also, when we were young, we were extremely competitive with each other. And that was a really our sole motivation to improving. And that is probably why we were successful early. And we won a national title in the juvenile category when we were the smallest, the youngest, and the most naive competitors in the event by far. Thankfully, during this time, we had parents that didn't ever force us to skate. They simply supported us every single step of the way and ensured that it was our decision to commit to skating together year after year after year after year <laughs> after year. And they also drove us to Waterloo at 4.15 a.m., three to four mornings of every week, so that we could practice for three hours there and then return home to London to go to school. I mean, talk about a family sacrifice. At the ages of just 13 and 15, we made the decision to move away from our families and move to, uh, move to Waterloo full time to train. And as you can imagine, this was an incredible sacrifice, but not one we ever thought twice about. I skipped grade eight in order to better manage our training schedule, and I'll never forget walking up the stairs to my new high school at just five feet tall, missing two of my front teeth. I mean, <laughs> talk about intimidating. We'd skate every morning from six to nine, go to school where, admittedly, I had a lot of lunches in the washroom until I made friends. No. We'd go back to the rink to work out or do ballet, go home, do homework, and it wasn't atypical for us to be in bed before 8 p.m. Now, that doesn't exactly sound like a, the schedule of a normal teenager, does it? Semi-formals, proms, parties, movies, sleepovers, not for us. In fact, that was a major turning point uh, for me in my career because if I was going to be away from my family and my friends and miss all these cool events, it really clicked. I was sacrificing a lot of things, so I was going to make it count. And that's the first time I learned that was in Waterloo. Also in Waterloo, we worked with a great choreographer, Suzanne Killing. And Suze was great because she encouraged us to look around and learn from the other teams that we trained with every day. What exactly were they accomplishing when they spent all session fighting or even all day fighting with each other? We'd have meetings with Suzanne daily. We'd talk about, uh, or sorry, excuse me, weekly, and we'd talk about daily goals. We'd talk about weekly goals, seasonal goals, even career goals that we had, but more importantly, we found what we were talking about, our feelings, how my actions made Tessa feel and vice versa. And that was a huge moment for us. It was pivotal because, let's face it, we were temperamental teenagers. <laughs> That's right. It was there 
that we learn to make effective and productive use of every minute on the ice working through our differences and cultivating a code of respect. We are two very different people, <laughs> but we worked hard at communicating, and we really made an effort to understand one another's processes. We never blamed one another, never name-called, never even told the other to shut up. <laughs> Ever. Ever. <laughs> That's actually true. Nobody really <laughs> believes us, but... After we had that established, we were 15 and 17, we had to take another leap. So we moved to Canton, Michigan, where we would train with Russian coaches and some of the best ice dance teams in the world. Again, this was a tough transition, to say the least. We found that there was little warmth in our new coaches, uh, especially in the beginning, and we needed to adapt a more independent model of training. We needed to be there for each other. We needed to be each other's family, and honestly, we relied on each other for almost everything. Including transportation, because I still wasn't old enough to drive. Everything was different across the border. In Waterloo, we lived with families. In Michigan, we both lived with young, competitive skaters. In Waterloo, we could attend regular high school. In Michigan, online education was our only option. In Waterloo, our coaches were like our family members. They were warm and friendly and approachable. In Michigan, well, let's just say it was a little different. <laughs> the skating world suddenly started to feel more and more isolating. And of course, the more success we experienced, the harsher that reality became. But our training atmosphere was unbelievable. We worked harder than we ever worked before and we pushed our bodies to the limits. We won titles, and we created programs that we loved, but we never stopped wanting more. We were hungry, we were determined, and we were unstoppable. Until, of course, we were stoppable. Yeah, just maybe a little <laughs> bit stoppable. In 2008, we became a silver medalist at the World Championships, our second Worlds only, and we even won the free dance portion of the event. And with the Vancouver Olympics on the horizon, we were setting ourselves up perfectly. And we felt like we needed to win the 2009 Worlds in order to just put us exactly where we wanted to be going into Vancouver. So we started putting in uh, 13, 14 hour days in the summer of uh, 2008. We wanted to stand out so bad and we wanted to make a statement and that's how we were gonna do it with these long training days. We I thought at that time that working harder and longer meant working better. What we didn't realize was that we were taking things a little too far. I developed an overtraining injury, an overuse injury in my shins that ultimately required surgery. And this was not part of our pre-Olympic plan. Definitely not. I was, diagnosed with, <laughs> I was diagnosed with chronic exertional compartment syndrome, which basically meant that I could skate for up to 30 seconds at a time or until my muscles were strangulated and an intense numbness and cramping took over. Mind you, our programs were four minutes, so 30 seconds didn't exactly get me too far. I remember sitting in our team doctor's office when she presented me with an ultimatum. She said, you can try the surgery, which may or may not work, or you can retire. It was devastating, and I felt guilty. I felt as if I was letting the team down. Surgery took place in October of 2008, followed by about a three-month rehabilitation program. The most interesting part about this time period was that Scott and I stopped communicating. He was training in Michigan, and I was recovering in London, and we just didn't know how to remain open and honest with one another. In retrospect, I think we were trying to protect one another. He didn't want to rub in the fact that he was healthy, able to train at 100% while not so patiently waiting for me to return to the ice. And I couldn't quite explain my pain, nor could I bring myself to deliver disappointing news day after day. Frankly, this was the hardest thing we've ever endured as partners. When Tess did return to the ice, she was frightened of the pain and, well, she had very little confidence in her skating ability. But 
we took the ice in January, just two months after uh, she had returned to the ice, actually one month after we returned to the ice, and we were at a national championships. And we were just hoping to make it to the end of our program with 6,000 people watching. Now, needless to say, that's not quite ideal, and I'm sure a lot of you know that the feeling of being unprepared is probably the absolute worst. Sorry. I'm not as good at this as she is, am I? She's just killing it. She doesn't need cue cards. Either way, we persevered through nationals and on to worlds or where we placed third, and it was it was a mixed emotions at that Worlds because for one side we were devastated that, you know, we weren't on track. We didn't feel like we were right where we wanted to be going into the Olympics. But to be honest, we were just so happy to have survived that treacherous season. Tess, however, still in a lot of pain, she was constantly trying to push through it. It was then that we adopted the mantra to adapt and conquer. We couldn't train like we had grown accustomed to, so we needed to create a new plan. We learned that we could form our own method of preparation, one that differed from our competitors, but still gave us an edge. At the time, it felt like no one was suffering like we were, but also no one was as appreciative of the ability to practice as we were. Okay, we'll fast forward a little bit to the Olympics in Vancouver. Sorry, it's hard to go through 17 years in this little window, but. <laughs> Trying our best. At 20 and 22, here we are, on the biggest stage in our sport, in our own country. It's an athlete's dream come true. To say that there was pressure was an understatement. Not to mention, Tess at this point, we didn't say a lot of this to the media, but she's still getting seven hours a day of physiotherapy at the games. And after a rough and painful week of training off-site following the opening ceremonies, we began practicing in the official arena just days before we were set to compete. The energy in the building just felt right. Judges watched our every move, and fans cheered us on so loudly that we could barely hear our own music. As the magnitude of the situation grew larger than life, our focus narrowed, and our world together became all that we saw. It was just us, two kids who trained their whole lives for this moment. Two friends who took the ice, reminding each other to take it one step at a time. Two people who shared a moment, seemingly unaware of the 30 million people sharing it with them. It was special, and it was ours. I don't want to be a downer after that part. It's so <laughs> nice. But we should take a moment to, re uh, to recognize that it's easy for us to romanticize our experience in Vancouver. It's easy to look back and think, we had the perfect skates, and everything was beautiful, and the stars aligned, and we had these magical moments. But that just wasn't the case. And I reminded Tessa on, on the way to, to our Sochi Olympic experience that we actually didn't skate perfectly going into the free dance. We bobbled in the beginning. We felt really out of unison. I almost hit the boards and even ended facing the wrong way, which the judges don't really appreciate. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, that was a really big lesson for Tess and I. It taught us that we needed to be the best even when we weren't at our best. The post-games whirlwind was a bit of a blur, but one that ended quickly because just three weeks after the closing ceremonies, we won our first world championship title in Torino, Italy. To be honest, we were relieved and exhausted and mostly just wanted to hibernate. <laughs> It was then that we made the decision to continue to compete. We felt we had more to give, more potential to explore. They say that winning the first time is easy. I don't know who they are, but I'm not sure that we necessarily <laughs> agreed with that. In some ways, being Olympic champions is empowering, but it also meant that we had these big targets on our back. We had more to prove, we had more expectations to meet, and we had a higher standard to achieve. But we embraced this. I mean, nobody wanted this as bad as we did. However, the stakes were high. Tess ended up having a second surgery in the fall of 2010 on both of her shins and her calves, again, to relieve the pressure in that muscle compartment. 
You'll be happy to hear, though, that we did a much better job of staying in touch and communicating the second time around. Hey. <laughs> yeah, yes. <laughs> Most importantly, when there was a time full of doubt, uh, I was still in pain and even considered a third surgery, the same surgery on my legs, I worked with a team of sports scientists and physiotherapists to change my mechanics, how I moved, what muscles I recruited, the brain patterns that cued my body. It was such a tedious process, almost like learning to write with your other hand, but it did allow me to skate without pain. We learned so much about ourselves, so much about our bodies, so much about what it meant to be an athlete. It was a new dimension to our training that was more intellectual and certainly more science-based. Interestingly, we felt we became the masters of our sport only after we'd already won the Olympics. Now, there's a little, little bit of our story that we might have, have left out to this point, but we'd be remiss if we didn't tell you that we trained with our biggest rivals for nine years, Merrill Davis and Charlie White. We shared the same coaching team of about five to ten people, and it was a very interesting dynamic, one that the media loved. They latched onto it because it was so unique to the sport of figure skating. Mostly for Tess and I, we found that it was a very positive and motivating environment. We had the rare opportunity to watch our closest competitors, day in and day out. How they were training, the moves they were doing, their attitudes, etc. But let's be clear about one thing, it was extremely tense. There's no doubt about it, between the four of us, we both wanted to win, and desperately. Tessa and I worked hard to find a balance there. We wanted to use them for additional motivation, but not get caught up in the politics of the rink. Every day, was a battle. Every day was a competition. But it helped secure the notion that while yes, we needed guidance and support from our coaching staff, no one was as invested in our career as we were. No one was going to hand us a medal just for showing up. We needed to make it happen, and we needed to take full responsibility. So we approached Sochi with the same but entirely different mindset as Vancouver. It was similar because we were there to win, we were prepared, we were in the best shape of our lives, and we knew we needed to be in unison and free of distraction in order to skate at our best. But it was different. Honestly, we were just four years older. Tessa this time, completely healthy, but we were keenly aware of the fact that it could be our last Olympics. You never know when you're going to get back. Not to mention, we better understood what the Olympics meant to us, what the Canadian flags on our back symbolized. So one of our goals became just being present in every moment. Whether we're at practice or in a workout or even just in the cafeteria talking to other athletes, we were going to be present. And we knew that we were going to be present if we got the chance to be on the podium. So to you was a dream. We had the opportunity to compete for two medals and received two silvers. One with Canada's figure skating team and one individually. Well, in individually, like, together. Yeah, as a We're, unit. Yeah, as a unit. We're one. <laughs> That's right. But it's funny, when, when we returned home from Sochi, everyone commented on the medals, saying things like, you were so classy, or you put on such a brave face for the cameras. But truly, our reactions were genuine. We had the absolute best skates we could have. Sure, we weren't satisfied with the silver, but we were satisfied with our performances. And in those moments when we hugged after the music ended, it was enough to fill our hearts. The silver was enough because of what it took to get. The silver was enough because of what it represented, which was a collection of moments that we've shared over the past 17 years. We are enough because we know what we invested. We're not defined by the color of metal. We're not defined by judges. We're not even defined by what it is we do on the ice. The most important lesson that we've learned along the way is this. As Tessa said, success is not complicated. It's hard work and there are no shortcuts. But the possibilities are endless. Someone is going to go out there and win the Olympics. Someone's going to fly to Mars. Someone's going to be, I don't know, the captain of the Toronto Maple Leafs or invent the next best thing. 
Why can't that someone be you? Why not? We must all recognize our own definitions of success. It doesn't matter what you choose to do, so long as you do it to the best of your ability. How do you want to be viewed? What is your character? What are your values? How would you like to be remembered? Ultimately, it doesn't matter that we happen to be decent figure skaters. What does matter, <laughs> what does matter is that we strive to be good people. We love what we do, and we follow our passions to the fullest. Do you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.